The Law Report with Tyrone Key. And a very good evening to you from tonight's Law Report program. As you know, once a month here on The Law Report, we run a legal clinic trying to answer a range of questions on a number of different topics. And tonight, it's again time to open the lines for you to ask that legal question that doesn't quite fit into the other topics we discuss here on The Law Report. And just before we begin, a reminder that there's a list of available documents on the Facebook page, Law on SAFM. If you'd like any of those, post a message on Facebook, but please do remember to include your email address. Or if you don't have access to Facebook, you can email me on law at safm.co.za and I can send you a copy of the list and then you can choose what you want. And I'm joined once again this evening by attorney Nicolene Skuman Lowe. She's a director of Skuman Law Inc., Conveyances and Notaries Public. Nicolene, welcome back to the show. First time for 2015. Mm, thank you for having me. Did you have a nice break? Yes, just too short, I think. Yeah, it's always just a little <laughs> bit too short. But it's nice to have you back, so thank you for joining us again. If you have any questions for us, you can call us now on 0892 10 2010. 10-2010. Bafana Bafana will be no pushovers as they square up against the Black Stars on the 27th of January 2050. On your favorite radio station and in your home of football, SABC World. Catch this action live from Estadio du Mongo with kickoff at 8 p.m. SABC Sport, bringing Equatorial Guinea closer to you. The Law Report with Tyron Key. Right, so before we begin, we're going to be taking some crossings to the Algeria versus South Africa game a bit later in the show, so stay tuned for that. But before we get on to your calls, we do have one or two emails we just need to get through. And the first one is, um, he says, I wonder if this scenario can be dealt with by one of your family lawyers. He wants to know about maintenance. If you and your wife are married for many years and have two adult children, you are the breadwinner providing all the needs of the family. What are the rights of a person who married in community of property and now, after so many years, wants to claim maintenance from you as the husband? Are there certain procedures to follow? And if there are, I will highly appreciate it if you can let me know. Right. So he says not a pleasant one to discuss and it must be treated with care. Mm. Yes, it's a bit of an awkward one. No, of course. And, and I think regardless of the circumstances that gave rise to the situation at hand, it's always a sensitive matter. Um Firstly, I think we need to distinguish between child's, a child's maintenance and a spouse's maintenance. Um, firstly, a, a child's maintenance payment is due regardless of how you and your spouse were married. Um, it's, it's about the biological connection and your, um, basically your, your uh, obligation as a parent, a biological parent, to sustain and support your child. So just to make that very clear, child maintenance is a very different topic to, to spousal maintenance. And from my understanding, this is about spousal maintenance. Because it mentions adult children, so they're out of so, the picture. Uh, <clears throat> presumably, there's no need for a maintenance mm. um, provision uh, unless one of them may be disabled anyway. So... Um, in, in terms of the spousal maintenance, the courts really do consider a variety of factors when determining whether a spouse really does have a maintenance claim. So these claims are not instituted or granted lightly by our courts. They'll look at things like how old the person is, yes, how long you were married, yes, who was the breadwinner, but also what is the likelihood of this person getting remarried to someone else, what is this person's income generating ability, um, even if they didn't work during the marriage, but if they maybe hold a qualification of some sort or have experience prior to, prior to marriage, then of course the argument could also be that they could very much go back to work and sustain themselves and therefore the maintenance won't be um, necessary. So it would really depend on, on who we're talking about and what the prospects of that person would be. Now, he mentions married in community of property, so I'm not sure whether they've got divorced at some point. What would be the case if they got divorced, neither of them is working, and they've now split what they had in half? Mm -hmm. Can the wife still claim from the husband? I mean... Of course... Anyone can institute any claim. The question is really whether it be, will be successful or not. And the court will measure um, that claim against the a wife in this instance ability to sustain herself potential of getting remarried and all these things and what were their standard of living together and 
considering the fact that the assets would already have been divided, could she not sustain herself from that division itself? You know, so it's it's a very complicated um, scenario. There's not a cut and dried thing that you can just no. automatically claim maintenance. You can claim it, but whether or not it will be it. successful is the other thing. And, you know, it, we need to strike a balance of fairness here. Um, during the marriage, of course, people are willing to contribute um, and if there's some factor that precludes the wife or the husband, for that matter, whoever is claiming maintenance against the other uh, from working and sustaining themselves, and they'll likely not get remarried. Maybe they've been married for so many years that, you know, the likelihood just isn't there in terms of age or, or whatever the case may be. So you're not really going to be able to give a definitive answer here. No. Has to actually be, you have to have some attorneys involved yes. looking at the entire sort of situation basically yes i would recommend that this listener goes and seeks legal advice and lays out all the details uh, to the attorney who would then be able to give a much more clear-cut answer than we've been able to okay right our next um, email is it says i met mr x in 2012 mr x had a company which is registered in his name i was an llb student when we met and mr x was a dropout of geology at the same university i advised him to further his studies the following year in 2013 he came to stay with me in my rented room while furthering his studies he proposed that i should market his company to which i agreed verbally the conditions of the agreement were that at the time the company got a project i would be legally registered as a shareholder of the company we marketed the company and got a sub tender in 2014. I managed the site alone as a manager for one month and upon my claim of being legally registered as a shareholder he no longer wanted to do so. In the company profile he referred to me as a manager but in our business communications in emails basically he referred to me as the managing director. And obviously now nothing's happened he was promised that he would be a shareholder and now that he's fulfilled what they verbally agreed to he's now being sort of mm. pushed aside. Now, this is a very unfortunate situation, and, and particularly given um, a potential friendship that probably existed here. Um, there's a distinction between serving as a manager or a director and a shareholder. And firstly, if if you are appointed as a manager or a director, it's, it's like holding employment. And um, you are entitled to be compensated in terms of, of the role that you would fulfill. In terms of a shareholder, uh, it's a bit more tricky in, in, in that sense to enforce your claim and to demand to become one. If there isn't anything in writing, selling a portion of the shares or, you know, it becomes he said, she said. So my my thoughts would be that being treated like a manager and being able to claim some form of remuneration for your time um, for the services you've rendered would be much more um, much more of a plausible way forward than than the claim of the shareholder of course if someone maybe overheard this communication or, or the verbal exchange is happening then you could call them as a witness and you could still bring a claim but the problem is always if you don't have anything in writing it becomes a very challenging circumstance to prove and to claim your shares so there's Pretty much not much unless he has a witness that he can actually do at this point. Of course, you can you can um, still approach court and detail all the communications and the emails. But, you know, if you only have a few emails calling you a manager or a managing director, that's a much different role to being a shareholder or a co-owner. So one can always bring it forward and see what the court makes of it. But in lack of, of better evidence, it would be quite a challenging situation to prove so unless there's some good witnesses or one or two emails further substantiating it i i don't think it looks very positive at this point That's unfortunately sad, actually yeah. Right. And I've just been told that most of the calls coming in this evening are for labor law, and that's not tonight. Um, Nicolene doesn't profess to be a labor lawyer. Unfortunately no. not. <laughs> and uh, Michael Bergen will be with us not next week, because next week we're doing property law. And the week after that, the first Monday of every month, Michael Bergen is here. So if you have a labor question, labor-related question, please save it for the first Monday of every month and call in then because Michael is the expert on labor mm, law and uh, Nicolene would tell you if you called in and we asked the question she would say please call back when Michael's here because <laughs> it's just so much easier right just a reminder you can call us if you have any questions we've just got two more emails to go and then we'll take your calls the number is 0892 
10 2010 0892 We'll take the shorter one before we get to the very long one. And it is, um, say, the listener says, I bought a laptop, but unfortunately given a wrong one. I came back after eight days and told that the seven-day period has expired. Now I'm claiming my change because I was given a cheaper one than the amount I've paid, and they're not cooperating. It's now been three months. What should I do? But I'm bearing in mind that they gave him the wrong one in the first place. Mm. Well, of course, hopefully this listener has got all the documentation um, that he, um, all the complaints and everything that would substantiate um, all the all the things that have gone wrong in this transaction so that he can at least um, build a proper case In and it's not he said, she said, as we mentioned with the previous question. Um, firstly, this would seem like the laptop was, was purchased from a dealer of some sorts. Um, I'm not sure if it's online or what the case may be, but um, in, in instances where transactions are entered into and the supplier sells a particular product or provides a service of a particular nature in their normal course of business, in other words, it's uh, an ongoing thing, it's not a once-off transaction, then the Consumer Commission would be the place to go, at least it's, as we know, it's like an ombud structure, so um, any poor consumer service, um, some including something like this where you um, purchase a specific product and you're giving given something completely different, um, you would be able to deal with through there. And the seven and eight seven day thing, is that still part of the thing or has that changed now with the new Consumer Commission? The Consumer Protection Act provides for a period of five days, which is what we call the cooling off period. So if you've purchased anything, you've got a five day, five working day being the keyword period or business day period, when you can return the goods and say, listen, I've changed my mind. Um, I don't want this anymore. Provided, of course, you haven't completely damaged mm. it and all of that. Reasonable, this still um, must still be considered. Um, but the seven days or eight days, as, as the case may be here, um, that's probably a, a store arrangement. And in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, all consumers are entitled to a good quality service of what they've requested. So... Um, a, a good quality product and service, if I may just correct myself there. And you've got a period of six months which the supplier must guarantee its quality and its durability. So seven days, eight days for returns. Um, I think if you, you refer this to the Consumer Commission, um, this would probably be turned around in all And in they've, all they've, they've given him another one, but it's a cheaper one than the one he paid for. So, I mean, that doesn't sound right no, either. No, that doesn't solve the problem. And if it's a case of um, being out of stock or something like that, then surely there should be some refund of some sorts and, and not a substitute of, of a lesser value. The Act is also very clear in that regard. If if substitutions are given, then it needs to be at the same quality and at the same um, level and durability as the, the consumer had originally signed up Because no, the listener says it's been three months and he still hasn't had any resolution here. No. Then I think mm. um, sooner rather than later, um, do report it to the Consumer Commission. Um, of course, one can always uh, approach the small claims court as well, but um, the Consumer Commission should also be able to assist. So whichever route, if you want to go the litigious route, um, there should be a, an amount below the threshold for the con small claims court. Otherwise, the Consumer Commission would be a good alternative. Great. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask us a question in a moment, we've got one more email left. The number is 0892 10 2010 0892 10 10. And bear in mind that Nicolene's favorite topic to talk about are wills. So mm. if you have anything to know about your will, please give us a call. Right, the next email we got from Craig. It's a very long email and it's all in Afrikaans. And luckily, Nicolene, yes, I mean, I can understand this, but I'm not going to read it all out and try and translate it myself. Mm. But basically what? He bought a car. Mm -hmm. And it seriously, literally from the first minute, this car, nothing was working on the car. Yes, it would seem that it's a second-hand um, bucky. Mm. And... Um, that all sorts of things started going wrong and um, back and forth between the supplier and it ends up that the listeners had to spend some money to replace um, some uh, a petrol pump and some tires and all sorts of things um, over and above the amount that he's paid for the purchase. And he's tried to return the vehicle and get a full refund, but he hasn't been successful in doing so. So... You know, it's not clear from, from this email whether or not this has been bought through a dealership or if it's been a private deal. 
Mm. All indications to to my mind are that it's leaning towards a private deal um, and not. He said a Twitter answer, Bucky Hookwhip. So it's a second hand yeah. Bucky that he bought, mm. and I would imagine that it was a private sale. It, it yeah, sounds to it, me. Yeah, it, 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 it keeps referring to. Um, um, but you know what, what is a little confusing to me is is it, there's no indication that it's a dealership, but then it refers to to a the, person the owner. being an owner. So you know, let's let's sketch both scenarios for for completeness sake, if okay. nothing else. In in the case where this is a private sale, unfortunately, the only recourse would be to claim damages through a court of law. So to go to an attorney and whichever damages you've suffered, um, including wanting to return the vehicle and get a full refund, you can then claim through a court structure. Of course, that is quite time consuming. And it's going to cost him a lot and possibly more than he spent. That's what I was going to say. Mm. This is probably going to cost more than, than what yeah, the, the purchase price for this bucky was. Um, and then the second option, of course, it, if it wasn't a private deal, but a dealership, then, of course, there are all sorts of regulations and regulatory bodies which um, could be going, uh, the listener could go through in order to get a resolution through a more of an ombud structure, um, such as the Consumer Commission. So, um, in addition to, of course, if he still wants to institute a damages claim, he's welcome to do so. But in addition to that, that's also an option. So, at this point in time, I'm quite reluctant to say that Given the amount, of the purchase price, given the amount of money that has been spent, um, I pick up 1,250 and 2,765 rand. Plus um, the price they bought it for was, what, 40, 49? 40. Give, make it, you know, let's round it up for ease of reference, 50,000. Mm. So if we add all of that together, I'm not saying that this is a small amount of money. It is a large amount of money, but legal costs... Um, and trying to launch this on an urgent basis and all of that, particularly with second heart and car salesmen, uh, it, it's not always possible to actually get any monies from these people. Mm. We we often refer to them as being men or, uh, well, you know, it's it's not intended to be gender specific, but men of straw. In other words, that uh, they've they've got a business and it looks legitimate, but actually it's an empty shell. So all these risk factors must be considered and, um, you know, in that sense, maybe a, an ombud structure would be a better call from a cost perspective. Okay, so Craig, if you are listening, I, I did email to tell you that we were going to talk about your, your question. If you are listening, maybe just drop me an email. Tell me whether it was a private sale or mm. whether it was a dealer. And if it was a dealer, um, I can then send you contact details of the ombud structure that you could contact and they could possibly help you. But mm. as Nicolene says, if it's a private sale, the only, only recourse is to go to court and that could end up costing you more than what you've spent already. Just bear in mind that ombud structures do not always uh, have the power to award damages mm. either because they don't f operate like a court of law that can test the authenticity of information in front of it. So, you know, you may in either event not 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 see the recourse there you is may often want. The possibility, though, that if this is a dealer, there could be a member of the yes. organization because there are all these motor yes. federation organizations. Um, there could be a member and then there could be something that could be done via that. So yes, of course. Just let me know if it's a, if it's a dealer or a private and sale. Then, and if it if it is a dealer, you know if it's a reputable one that we can check all these things, and mm. you know that would be the best chance. Right. Okay. Let's take our first call. Just remember the nine numbers call oh eight nine two ten twenty ten. John in Friedenburg. I'm hoping to take your call now, but I see that my studio crew are all on the phone. Um, just let me see. John, are you with us? No, John isn't with us just yet. John, oh. John, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there he is. You? Hello, yes. yes, I can. It's all just a bit go, go, go with the soccer tonight. So how can we help you? Uh, yes, I just, uh, I'm hopeful that your panel can, can assist me and give me some good advice as you have the other listeners. Um, basically, I have approached a, a law firm in, 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 in Friedenburg and asked them to, to become my attorneys of record uh, to register a trust. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then what happened was uh, they agreed and uh, I assumed that uh, we are in business. But then, uh, you know, a couple of months later, uh, late in last year, in fact, uh, last month, uh, they, uh, uh, the, one of the attorneys of the very same firm then uh, opted to, to represent somebody else against me in another matter. And um, I uh, was given the assurance that this attorney would not 
uh, continue re- his representation of the third party. Uh, but but then, uh, yes, last week, I received a, uh, a summons from the High Court and this attorney signed the papers. What can I do? What recourses are there available uh, if, if, if uh, attorneys uh, are, act like that? Wow, um, this is quite shocking. It's a conflict of interest, surely. <laughs> this, this is a very clear conflict of interest. So I would recommend that you um, take this to the Law Society um, and report it. And this is most certainly not um, not acceptable that you are instructed as an attorney, whether it's um, to register a trust, to draft a will, a contract, whatever the instruction may be, and then also to act against that very same client. Um even if it's a different attorney to the one you actually saw uh, for purposes of registering this trust. So I would strongly recommend that you com- institute a complaint at the Law Society. And it be the oh. Law Society of the Northern Provinces? No, it, no, no. Where are you, Friedenberg? Friedenberg um, well, would still be a Cape Law oh, Society. Oh, still the Cape Law Society. Mm. Okay. Uh, Cape actually, Law Society. But don't, don't leave it, John, because it sounds horrendous. It is horrendous. Look, I, I, I got divorced about five years ago and I paid this very, the same lawyer who's now acting against me, oh uh, um, a 20,000 rand for a divorce case, which is now, uh, in today's terms, is uh, around about 8,000 uh, if it's contested. I, uh, I mean, uncontested. But uh-huh. I paid him 20,000 rand and I received a call from him um, also in last week uh, telling me I owe him more money and this guy would just not leave me, you know. He's, he's, he's asking for money and he's harassing me and I'm thinking, wow, and your firm uh, it just does not make sense i mean uh, uh, from i heard from his partner that he spoke to him and, and he inquired whether the attorney uh, that i'm talking about actually contacted me uh, to tell me that he's no longer representing the third party and i, I was astonished and i said no he never contacted me about any such thing but that's a relief only to receive the papers and i mean on top of that to have somebody uh, 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 a legal professional at that, uh, you know, almost extorts money out of me for 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 a service that was settled out of court. Uh, mm. I don't I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm baffled no. as much as I you think, are. <laughs> no, no, definitely. And I think you need to raise all these points, you know, with the account and and make sure that you, um, if if they continue requesting more money, so that you get a full statement of account that you can see uh, how they've previously accounted your your payments that you've made and all of that um, but it, it just makes it much worse seeing that there's a a very long history of um, of an engagement with this firm not just this trust that you've now um, uh, instructed them to register on your behalf that there's been a, a relationship for much longer than that and they are still acting against you for another party so most definitely something you must report to the law society okay okay thank you so very much for your good luck john excuse me good thank luck. you very much and good luck to you guys too and you're doing great work and please keep it up thank you so much thanks okay. john great good night to you all right you have any questions for us the number 0892 10 2010 0892 10 2010 in park good evening uh, good evening Karen. how are you i'm very well how are you i'm fine thanks how can we help you tonight um, I'd just like to know where is the best place to have a will. I have one at the bank at the moment, but lots of people say it takes a long time if once I die to uh, settle the will. Nicolene? Well, um, you know, without sounding biased as an attorney, I um, I do agree with the opinion that you've gotten elsewhere that it's not not always the best idea to have a will with a bank or any financial institution for that matter Mm -hmm. um, including insurance brokers because unfortunately um, especially if you don't have a massively large estate um, you bluntly put your your estate doesn't get the priority that some of the larger ones may get and then as a result it takes a really long time to handle everything and to settle it so I would recommend that you rather go to an attorney who is properly qualified to draft a will. It's it's a very special document. I mean, it needs to speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. So it can't be vaguely drafted. It can't have sweeping sentences in it. It needs to be very specific and it needs to be done by someone who does it regularly. And usually most, um, most firms give you a, uh, an original to keep somewhere safe in your house. 
we yeah. as a firm tell you to tell someone where you've put it mm. um, and then the firm usually also stores it some of them charge for it we by example don't so find an, a firm that could um, that could really um, assist you in in a way that um, would suit you best do you have a very basic wall Marianne or is it lo- full of lots of interesting things um, no, it's a basic wall. It's just a uh, ghost of my, my brothers and sisters, and if they passed away to my nieces and nephews. The reason I'm asking you, is this something that Marianne could do during Wolves Week? Um, if it involves minor children, unfortunately not. No, um, I'm not married and I have no children. It uh, goes all to my brothers and sisters or my nieces and nephews. Uh, are the nieces and nephews all over 18? Um, yes, they've already got their own children. Okay, okay. Well, then, fair enough. Then uh, it could be something that could be done during World's Week, um, but I'm never comfortable to tell someone to postpone it for six That's months long. or mm. eight months because you never know what can happen. Mm. So I, w- I would, I always feel much more comfortable if you are interested in updating your will to rather make it a priority. Okay, and must I, <coughs> excuse me, must I have an att- uh, a trustee or anybody? To represent the will or something? You need to have an executor, executor. which I recommend to uh, personally. My my opinion on the matter is to um, appoint someone like a brother or a sister, someone that you really trust and knew you well, mm-hmm. um, who can always go to an attorney or, or someone to assist them. Um, I don't believe in appointing an attorney just, um, you know, for the sake of having an attorney act as an executor. Mm-hmm. They charge the maximum fee then and you know you don't have uh, many you don't have as much control over it if it is um, someone who's close to you. And, and if you have your will at the bank the bank then becomes the executor am I correct? Yes. Yes. No, so Mary Ann, the sooner you maybe get your brother or sister or somebody as the executor and put it with an attorney mm. is possibly your best bet. Just remember the, that the executor must be a local South African for practical reasons. Yeah, well, it will either be my, my sister or brother or my niece. Yes. Because um, and we they always, know me the best. <laughs> fantastic. And, and we always say have, have two people. So one in the alternative of the other. Mm. And um, also that, um, you know, as an executor, yes, there's a lot of admin involved. But sometimes you need to make a judgment call on something, uh, for example, to sell something because there's a cash shortfall in the estate and then you have to pick something. Yeah. And if you didn't know the person really well, you know, most of us will pick what is, is will yield the most. Well, look, the house will have to be sold because this, I can't leave it. I've got seven, um, six brothers, you know, six family members. So I can't leave it to one of them. No, of course. Now, I, I always recommend <laughs> to, um, if there's a fixed property, to rather sell it. Mm. Um, if there's more than two owners, I have a personal rule of thumb. It spells trouble. <laughs> No, I'm not um, any owner. <laughs> if they, no, if you leave it, no, to, you more leave it than, to more than, more than two, um, even if they get along fabulously during your lifetime, mm. they don't always get along as fabulously after. After. Not in my experience, but uh, I don't mean to, to be... Uh, Disparaging of your <laughs> <yes>. family. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but Marianne, it sounds like you need to go and find an attorney and yes. uh, go and draw up a will and make your, one of your family members or two of them the executors of your, of your estate. Okay, thanks a lot, and thanks for a really nice program. It's a pleasure, and good luck to you. Good okay. luck. Thanks, Marianne. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, the number to call if you have a question, 0892102010. Jacques in Cape Town, good evening. Hello, Jacques. Hi. How Hi. Are you? Hi, very well, and you? Fine, thank you. How can we help you? Well, this one's going to be a bit interesting. Um, uh, we um, uh, had a company together, uh, you know, and we were uh, four shareholders in the company a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, three of the uh, company directors fired the fourth one. Fourth one retaliated by taking legal action and so forth, you know, and he bypassed the shareholders' agreement by going to arbit- directly to arbitration, you know, and um, and so forth. And um, uh, but in the end, we, we, we you know, we, we appointed a legal um, representation or representative for us uh, to represent the three uh, shareholders. Mm. Um, uh, the, we, we made, um, you know, payments because there's periodic uh, in, invoices and bills that have, that have been sent to us, and we made some payments. And um, uh, due to confusion on their side, uh, they 
they, you know, they, they think or they, they, they thought, so they were under the, under the impression that we did not pay certain invoices, which we proved sub subsequently we did. Uh, but they withdrew and, um, you know, it, it led to a, um, uh, they withdrew at a very critical time, probably about two, three days before, uh, you know, before our court appearance and so on, leaving us in a very precarious position, um, uh, leading to, you know, judgments worth millions against us. And we had, you know, we, we, we're still fighting to get rid of some of them uh, because we, we didn't have ample representation. Mm. Um, uh, well, I mean, what, do we have any recourse here? Yeah, of course, by the sounds of it, um, if you can prove that all those payments were made, um, then then most definitely you can at least, a starting point would be to uh, approach the Law Society and to institute a, uh, a complaint there against the firm, proving, uh, you know, the invoices and the payments and all the correspondence, you know, attaching all of that to your complaint. So that would be the starting point. And of course, if you say you've lost millions, then... I, I want to say, consider taking legal action against this firm. They all have legal insurance, so you know it's it won't be a case of bringing an action and you know them turning around saying, "Oh, sorry, we can't pay." We all must have um, legal insurance against things like this. Oh, I see. Okay, so so they do have insurance, so it's mm. not a personal liability because our fear was that I mean, there's no way in a month of Sundays this, uh, this lawyer will come up with this kind of money. Uh, you know, in in the case of of us winning, uh, you know, against things, yeah. so we it's thought that uh, you know we'd be throwing good money off the bed. No, you know, um, in in terms of only the law society's um, uh, insurance provisions to us, we are covered for just over a million per practitioner. Right. Okay. So right. um, at least you've got that, and most of us with larger firms have additional insurance. I see. So um, usually it gets um, diverted to the Fidelity Fund, um, and they then deal with these these um, claims. So you don't even have to necessarily approach court. You can write a letter to the attorney, report them to the Law Society and to the Fidelity Fund, and in some instances, then um, you know if the firm admits liability, then the payment can happen without you actually having to sue them for damages. I see. Now, uh, you know, when uh, at the time we considered approaching the, the Law Society, but, if, you know, it, it seemed that the website or the point of entry for, for complaints mm. uh, was quite, quite uh, hidden, well hidden and difficult, you know. Okay. And, and um, we, we called around and, you know, then, then it was uh, basically a members only kind of uh, entry point. Uh, oh. You know, there was there was no recourse or for online forms that you know complaint forms for the public or for for any you know I don't know whether it's changed, but uh, it was very difficult for us to actually access uh, you know or get into contact with the correct people at the law society. There was no okay. official complaint line or something like that. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, from from an attorney's perspective, um, you know, their website was uh, admittedly quite user unfriendly a couple of yes. years yes. ago, yes. Um, but they have uh, they have. Uh, improved that quite a bit and I, I know for a fact that anyone that phones them at this point and says you know I want to complain against an attorney um, whoever picks up the phone is quite willing to put you through to the relevant department and to even fax the forms over to you if you can't download them excellent thanks so, for the good advice I appreciate it all the Have best a lovely evening thanks Jacques good luck to you <laughs> thanks good Thank night you. bye bye, okay. bye. Right. Is tonight the night of horrendous stories? It seems like it, you know. It's we, like I'm starting to get quite nervous now. <laughs> exactly, and you know, we're sitting on the opposite side yes. of the table. All I'm hearing is, is these these bad apples, really, know, that, that are making, that are really tainting the, the profession, you know. We're trying to do something good here, not all of us. No, and I'm just all always in listening. <laughs> I only pick the good ones. I only pick the good ones. <laughs> right, okay, so let's go to Jean in Durban. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for taking the call. It's a pleasure. Uh, as a trustee of a body corporate, do the trustees have the right to tell an owner to terminate a tenancy on the grounds of consistent non-compliance by the tenant over a period of close to four years? That's always a tricky one. Um, Firstly, I, I know of many um, sectional title schemes that have actually amended their conduct rules so that it could make provision for the eviction of another owner's tenant. Um, I haven't read any case where this has been successful. So um, 
my my advice would be really to write to this owner and to um follow your conduct rules if it allows for fines um keep instituting fines you know those kind of things but really forcing the owner to evict that tenant um that you know hasn't been proven successfully in any court to my knowledge so that would be an interesting an interesting course of action to take you won't be able to directly evict the tenant yourself because you are not the owner Yes. No, so um, you'll have to apply to court for, um, you know, either the tenant um, reinstating certain or, or making good certain damages that they've caused, or the, in the alternative, if they're such a nuisance, then of course to to move for the eviction. Whether or not that will be successful, I am very doubtful. Many people have tried to incorporate it into the conduct rules so that they at least can fine the owner, which eventually forces the owner to evict the tenant because it becomes financially, um, it becomes a financial strain. Is the owner sort of playing ball here, Jean, or not really? No, not really. That's the problem. We have fined the tenant, the owner, on a number of occasions. She's referred the fine to the tenant. Mm. They are currently contesting fines. Prove it. Mm. And in some instances, it it is quite difficult to prove that the tenant did A at such and such a point in time. Mm. Um, And then the other thing, can we go to a lawyer and have a lawyer write a letter Mm. and put the the legal fees on the owner's account? Yes. you can most certainly do that if there's a violation of some sort. Of basically of any kind. So where the, where the tenant has consistently violated, mm. for example, park rules relating to parking, um, and we have attempted unsuccessfully to, to deal with the issue, mm. can we now just, without consulting the owner further, just go and say, well, we're, we're now going straight to a lawyer? Well, you know, um, at, at most, you, you would be facing paying the the attorney out of pocket if the owner contests the validity of whichever notice you're sending them but it again depends on what your conduct rules make provision for i've worked with a number of sectional title schemes that have built in a fine system in addition to a legal recourse system so we will go through the fines procedure. Some of them even have an appeals procedure against the fines. And if that fails, then we go to an attorney and, you know, then Is you pick up the tab. And and if the owner contests that, then, um, you know, you end up in arbitration in all likelihood until the Sectional Titles Act has been amended and the Sectional Title Ombud has been created. Now, the way that the genus is, is obviously they're dealing with what they have in their rules. Is there, at any point, can they have a whatever kind of a meeting and change any of those rules or yes. add something to those rules for future? And Jean, maybe you should do that. Yes, yes, of we course, can. Those rules need to, AGM we can mm. propose. You can propose the amendments, and that's particularly useful given the fact that the new Act, I don't know how much you know about the new legislation, but the new legislation is causing quite a, quite a bit of confusion. So... Um, you know, many um, sectional title schemes are actually advised to revise all their rules in anticipation of these new regulations. Um, Corin, I know you give out uh, documentation that would assist. Yes. Have you got anything specific? Well, for next us? Yeah. next next week, Jean, we're doing property law, and Ishmael Mohammed, who is our resident property attorney, this is one of his favourite topics: is sectional title and things okay. like this. So, um, if you want to, maybe possibly call in again next week, and we can, you can talk directly to him as well. But I will. I've got your phone number. I'm going to put you back to my producer now, and just give him your email address, Jean, and then I will have a look and see what I've got, and I'll send you what I do have. I do have something on sectional title. Thank you. And may I not ask one more quick, quick sure. question? Um, where, where the tenant and the owner constantly come back to the trustees and say, you're racist. You know, we say, don't do this, and we're victimizing and we're racist. It, it, do we have any recourse on that because it becomes so wearying? Of course you can... Um, um proceed with court action on on the basis of defamation of character and and things like that or you know get an interdict against them to um, restrain them as the Americans put it a restraining order but all of these things are quite exorbitant in costs so um, 
you know, in, in many instances, uh, schemes have found it useful to di divert those kind of uh, that kind of correspondence to the managing agent, who then deals with it. They don't know the people um, personally, um, so maybe something something more more practical is is a better solution than proceeding to court, which may be quite costly, in my opinion. Okay. Jean, I was say, I'll, I'll try. I'm going to put you back to the producer now. If you could just give him your email address, and then I will see what I've gotten to send you. And but if you want to call in and speak to Ishmael next week, that you can do that as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jean. Thank you. Good night Good to night. you. And you're tuned to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. I'm Karen Key, and this is the Law Report. My guest tonight is Attorney Nicolene Skuman Lo, a director of Skuman Law Inc. Conveyances and Notaries Public, practicing here in Cape Town. And we're doing a law clinic, so no fixed topic. If you have any questions, we just have a few minutes left. You can call us on 0892 10 2010. Cyril in the Eastern Cape, good evening. Good evening, Karen. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Okay, I have to say it's the first time I get on to SAF, and your number is a lot easier this time around. Oh, well, welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you on the show. Thank you. Okay, I'm calling in connection with um, an, um, a friend of mine embezzled my money, or rather stole my money from me. He didn't necessarily steal because I gave it to him like uh, we normally would do um, business together, but small business. So... He got a tender of 167000 and he was short of 42000 and he promised to give me 20000 on top of that. I mean, I think it was 20, yeah, in total, but yeah, it was some 20-something thousand. Uh, you see, I'm not even sure because we never wrote it down. So, mm. well, that's not good. Yeah, I know it's not good at all. <laughs> so after that, when he got the money, um, well, he kept on postponing, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. So I could not take him to any court because we never wrote anything down. But then recently he sent me an SMS with a breakdown of everything that we did together. I just wanted to ask, can I use that mm. in court? Uh, like uh, just an SMS, is it good enough? And he's been running away from signing anything. I, I haven't seen him in ages. Uh, well, this happened last year. Haven't seen him in months. Well, basically, so, Cyril, I think if he sent if he sends you the SMS with that, mm, that's an admission that he owes you that money, surely. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I, I would would strongly advise that you now seek legal advice and you try and uh, collect the money through court. Okay, and um, so uh, will, will, will that cost me? Because, uh, okay, so is there any way I can, anything I can do not to be charged? Because I actually took money for my school fees mm. that they even said a part of it. Oh, goodness. No, you see, um, I don't know if there are any attorneys that will work on a contingency fee basis. Um, many debt collectors do, but be careful of those that you choose. Um, many of them don't don't work along ethical lines and they're not properly, properly registered with the Debt Collectors Association and all these things. So if you are going to go for a debt collector who usually collects the money and the pay, so to speak, that they get is the taking a portion of the money they collect on your behalf so they don't actually charge you um, that would be the only option for you know to get someone to collect the money against no payment of fees but they will still charge you a com partly mm, a they'll, commission they'll, basis almost. yeah it's almost like a commission mm. that they then take so oh. but make sure if you if you do go that route that you choose someone that is properly registered with the organize the the debt collectors association and that has a good reputation all right and if i i i once had of i don't know whether it's legal legal le aid yeah legal legal aid. Mm. legal aid if you own any property if you own a earn a salary anything like that um, as I believe the threshold is 2,000 rand a month. If you earn anything more than that in interest that you earn or anything, uh, property that you rent out, any income that you have, they won't help you, unfortunately. Oh, oh sorry. It's uh, sorry. It's legal assist. Yes, I, oh, I legal assist. That. But that's a private company. That, yeah, that's I think not that's a, an insurance company yeah, I, like uh, Legal Wise. Yes, you would have had to pay yeah. a monthly sort of instalment mm. and become a member, and it's it, mm. over a couple of years or whatever. Yeah, it's, like an, it's like an insurance policy. Insurance policy. Yeah, mm. that's who all they right. are. But that thing on your SMS, don't delete it, Cyril. Yeah, all very right, important. Uh, Print it out if you can. 
All right. Thank you very Good much. Good luck. Thanks so Thank much for you. calling. Good night Bye. to you. On the 20th of January, catch the opening Group D matches with Cote d'Ivoire take on Guinea at 6 p.m. and Cameroon tackle Mali at 9 p.m. The next Group D encounters on the 24th of January says Cote d'Ivoire versus Mali at 6 p.m. and Cameroon versus Guinea at 9 p.m. Finally, to wrap up action in this group on the 28th of January, Cameroon plays Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea battles Mali with both matches kicking off at 8 p.m. SABC Sport bringing Afcon 2015 Equatorial Guinea. Closer to you. The Law Report with Tyron Key. We have just less than a minute, but before we go, I just wanted to ask you, we mentioned earlier in the program, I mentioned about Wills Week. When mm. is it this year? It's usually in September, October. So usually some years at the end of September, other years beginning of October. Um, the minute we know... We'll distribute the information. Okay, because... But we always take part in it, as you know. As we know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to get people's minds into that mode. Yeah. Because when a time comes, there's not that many slots available. And you need to get yourself moving. Because if you haven't had mm. a will before... And we had some wonderful emails last year from people who'd never mm. had a will. Or who had taken their workers, possibly, to go and have a will done. And yes. were so delighted. And which was wonderful. So, please... Bear that in mind again. It's completely free, but it has to be a basic will. Yes. Not one with 10 million and, things yeah, in it and, it's and no property updates. and updates yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Basic will, but you need that. Of so course. It's coming. And, you know, we, we also have uh, an offering at the firm, which um, is, is very reduced at the, the rate for a basic will. So if you're in a hurry and you need one now before and you're in Cape September, Town. October, and you are in Cape Town, that's also on the website. Great. Well, my thanks once again this evening to Nicolene skuman Lowe. She's a director of Skuman Law, Inc., Conveyances and Notaries, public practicing here in Cape Town. And she's been my guest on tonight's edition of the Law Report program. We'll be running legal clinics like this one on the second Monday of every month. And Nicolene will be back with us again on Monday, the 9th of February. Nicolene, once again, thank you so much. Mm, thank you for having me. The Law Report is on the air on SAFM every Monday evening between 9 and 10. And a reminder, there's a list of available documents on the Facebook page, Law on SAFM. If you'd like any of those, post a message on Facebook. But please do remember, because a lot of you still don't, include your email address. Or if you don't have access to Facebook, email me on law at safm.co.za and I can send you a copy of the list and then you can choose what you want. I'll be back with you again tomorrow evening just after nine with Health Matters, so join me then. Stephen Kirk is up now with some nighttime music. Hello, Stephen.